saying it's a dangerous thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. It's a dangerous thing to offer up to God excuses of why you can't serve him. Pastor Roger Bradley from Church on the Rock in Pascagoula, Mississippi. And this guy is a pastor and a pastor's pastor. Uh, I love you, man. Love you, buddy. Uh, you have been such a blessing all these years. Uh, is your mic turned on good? We got you up good and everything? Yep. Yes, One, looks two. like it is. Looks like all it. right. Let me, let me pull this up here so we can get you in the light so that people at home can see you. You good, bud? Y'all stretch your hands this way and let's pray for Pastor Roger and his church. Father, Lord, in the name of Jesus, we pray today, Lord, that you would bring us the word, Lord, and your spirit through Pastor Roger, Lord. We pray, God, that you would bless his family there in Pascagoula, Lord, and the church there, God. We thank you for their participation, Lord, and in the missions activities that we're doing, Lord, and all the things, God, that we do together here in our, in our beloved nation, Lord, and around the world. I ask you, Lord, to bless us with open hearts and open minds so that we can hear your word, Lord, and today be made to be a little more like you. In the name of Jesus, amen. 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 God bless you, buddy. Amen. What a joy and a privilege and an honor to be back here at Golden Triangle Church on the Rock. Um, I always tell Pastor Ron, of course, he, as he said, was planning on not being here, but uh, they called and said, would you be interested in coming anyway? I said, absolutely. All I ever need is an invitation because of all the places that I have opportunity to preach, this is absolutely my favorite place to come. I love your pastor. I love this church. Um, woman was walking by, walking to work one day and she walks by a pet store, and there's a parrot outside the pet store, and she walks by. The parrot looks at her and says, lady, you are one ugly lady. <laughs> and she sort of stiffened her back and walked on to work, and she come back home. And as she passed back by, he looked at her and said, yep, still ugly. <laughs> so she goes home. She's really bothered by this. The next morning... She gets back. She gets right in front of the parrot. Parrot says, you haven't changed a bit, lady. You are one ugly woman. So the lady goes in the pet store, and she says, I need to speak to the owner. And she talks to the owner. She says, listen, I have to walk by here every day, back and forth to work. And every day, this parrot insults me and calls me ugly. And the owner says, ma'am, I'm so sorry. This parrot sometimes just gets an attitude and says what he wants to say. I give you my word. It will not happen again. So she says, okay. She leaves. She goes to work. She comes home that evening, and she gets by the parrot. She's looking at the parrot. The parrot's looking at her. She gets kind of close, and the parrot hasn't said anything, and she kind of smirks. And just as she gets even with the parrot, the parrot looks at her and says, you know. <laughs> <laughs> So I tell you that to say some things go without saying, you know, and uh, it could go without saying, but I'll say it anyway. I love your pastor. He and I have been friends for over 25 years. I'm, I'm not sure exactly how long, but he is, the great thing about it, your pastor is my pastor. He's been a mentor. He's been a friend. And um, this is my home away from home. I love this church. I love what you do, the outreach that you do. And it's always a joy to come and be here. My wife sends her blessings and her greetings from Pascagoula. We, um, we actually bought a restaurant a little over a year ago. So she had to work yesterday while I played. And um, so she did not get to make the trip. And, but she said to please tell you all hello. I did bring a friend of mine with me. Harvey Barton is my brother in Christ. Um, 
often my traveling companion. We do a lot of road trips together. He's my attorney, and he's my friend, except when we play golf together. Um, but turns out we're both very competitive, so we have sort of an ongoing grudge match, but uh, glad that he's with me today. If you have your Bibles, I'm going to be reading out of Exodus chapter 32. And I believe the Lord has given me a word for somebody today, and I hope that uh, this word is for you. Before I really get into the, the meat of what I want to talk about, I want to show you one thing in this chapter that, um, well, it just interests me. It, it shows me how silly sin can make you look. You know, the devil loves to make you look silly. And when we try to offer up excuses to God as to why we can't serve him or why we're doing this or that, it often just makes us look silly. So I want to read you a couple of verses, and then we'll kind of get into more of what I want to talk to you about. But if you look at Exodus 32, chapter 1, um, it says, When the people saw how long it was taking Moses to come down off the mountain, they've been, of course, led out of the land of Egypt, and now they're in the wilderness, and Moses has gone up to talk to God. So it says, When they saw how long it was taking Moses to come back down the mountain, they gathered around Aaron, who was second in command, and they said, Come on, they said, make us some gods who can lead us. We don't know what happened to this fellow Moses who brought us out here from the land of Egypt. So Aaron said, take the gold rings from the ears of your wives and your sons and your daughters and bring them to me. All the people took the gold rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron. Then Aaron took the gold, melted it down, and pay attention to this, he molded it into the shape of a calf. The King James says he fashioned it with a graving tool. So you get that. He, he created this golden calf. Now, when the people saw it, they exclaimed, Oh, Israel, these are the gods who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Aaron saw how excited the people were, so he built an altar in front of the calf, and then he announced tomorrow will be a festival to the Lord. The people got up early the next morning and sacrificed burnt offerings and peace offerings. After this, they celebrated with feasting and drinking and indulged in pagan revelry. Okay, so fast forward over to verse 19. It says, when they came near the camp, Moses saw the calf and the dancing, and he burned with anger. He threw the stone tablets to the ground, smashing them at the foot of the mountain. He took the calf they had made and burned it. Then he ground it into powder, threw it in the water, and forced the people to drink it. Finally, he turned to Aaron and he demanded, What did these people do to you to make you bring such terrible sin upon them? Now listen to Aaron's response. I love this. Don't get so upset, my lord, Aaron replied. You yourself know how evil these people are. They're just a bad bunch. You, you know them. You know how evil that they are. They said to me, make us gods who will lead us because we don't know what happened to this fellow Moses who brought us up out of the land of Egypt. So I told them, whoever has gold, jewelry, take it off. When they brought it to me, I simply threw it into the fire and out came this calf. I love that. He said, I threw it in. I, I don't know. Here, the calf come walking out. I don't know what happened. You know, it, it didn't say I, I fashioned it with, a, with a, you know, a tool that I created and made this thing. I just threw it in the fire, and lo and behold, it's a cow. Sin makes you look silly. When you begin to offer up to God excuses of why you're not serving him, it often makes us look silly. Now, I love this story in, in Exodus chapter 32. I love it because uh, it's one of those stories that about the time you think you have God figured out, you'll come across a story like this that just blows your hair back. And how many of you have ever had family or friends who just wouldn't do right? Anybody? They just won't do right. You know, you, 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 you pray for them. 
uh, you, you, you witness to them, you talk to them. It seems like the more you talk, the more you pray, the more you witness, the worse they get, right? And people can get heavy when you're trying to carry them. There's an old song that says, he ain't heavy, he's my brother. That's a lie. Even brothers get heavy, right? Even people you love get heavy, especially when you begin to try to carry other people's burdens, and you're doing everything you can to help them. But you know, one of the things that I tell people in counseling all the time, I'll work with you. I'll do anything. I'll talk to you. I'll be there for you anytime. What I will not do is I will not work harder than you do. But sometime when we're trying so hard, a guy was standing on a bridge one time threatening to dr- jump off to his death. And a guy pulls up in a car and sees him. And he gets out. He says, man, listen, nothing's that bad. Don't do this. He said, talk to me. Tell me what's going on. And the guy turned around and he started telling him all of his problems. And the guy stood there for 30 minutes listening to this guy's problems. When he got through, both of them jumped. (laughs) You know, sometimes people get heavy when you're trying to deal with all of their problems. And this is sort of how Moses felt about the children of Israel. The more he talked, the more he preached, the more he prayed, it seemed like the worse they got. And it even seems like the more God did for them, the worse they got. The more provisions God gave them, they would, they would still go from bad to worse. And now Moses has gone up to the mountain to talk to God. And, and when he's gone, of course, they build the golden calf. And, and here, when he comes down, they're down here dancing and worshiping this golden idol. And God begins to speak to Moses. In verse number 7, it says, The Lord told Moses, Quick, go down the mountain. Your people, whom you brought from the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. How quickly they've turned away from the way I commanded them to live. They've melted down gold and made a calf, and they've bowed down and sacrificed to it. They're saying, these are the gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Then the Lord said, I have seen how stubborn and rebellious these people are. Now leave me alone so my fierce anger can blaze against them, and I will destroy them Then I will make you, Moses, into a great nation. Now that's the text I want to use this morning, particularly in verse 10, where the Lord tells Moses, Now leave me alone so my fierce anger can blaze against them, and I will destroy them. Then I will make you, Moses, into a great nation. And so the title of my message this morning is, The Day God Said Leave me alone. Leave me alone. This statement that God makes to Moses fascinates me. It scares me a little bit, but it intrigues me. Leave me alone so I can kill them. Leave me alone so that my wrath may wax hot against them and I may consume them. God says to Moses, leave me alone. As if Moses could stop him. And I think that's what, that's what intrigues me about this verse. Because if I interpret this correctly, and I think I do, then, then the implication here is that one man is standing between the wrath of God and an entire nation. And God is asking Moses to step aside so he can get on about the business of pouring out his wrath and destroying this nation. I mean, basically, God is is saying to Moses, you know, Moses, my fight's not with you. My fight is with this people. Now step aside so I can deal with it. How many know that God hates idolatry? God hates idol worship. How many know it doesn't have to be a golden calf? But it may be a house, maybe a car, maybe a job, maybe maybe a church. It may be another person. 
Anything that you put before God is idolatry, and God hates it. It may be pleasure. The Bible says that in the last days, men would become lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. So I guess the, the $10,000 question is, what's your golden calf? I mean, this is one of the big ten. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. You know, this is, this is one of the big ones. What is your golden calf? What is it that takes precedence in your life? What is it that you keep putting ahead of God and telling God that I can't serve you because? Lord, I can't, I can't worship you because. I can't study your word because. I, I can't pay my tithes because. I can't go to church because. The Bible said it's a dangerous thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. And I'm telling you, it is a dangerous thing to offer up to God excuses of why you can't serve him. I would hate to tell God or tell someone, hey, pastor, I can't go to church because you know, it's my kids. By the time I get them out of bed and I get them dressed and I get them fed, I mean, there's no way I can do that and still get to church. What if God should say, okay, I can remove that excuse. I'm not saying God would or wouldn't. I'm saying it's a dangerous thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. It's a dangerous thing to offer up to God excuses of why you can't serve him. Uh, so, so uh, God says, let me alone, that my wrath may wax hot against them, and I may consume them. And understand, this is not some enemy camp. These were his people, his chosen people, the children of Israel, covenant people. This is people that he just delivered out of Egypt. These are his people. In fact, there seems to be some dispute even about that. If you look at verse 7, it says, The Lord told Moses, quick, go down the mountain. Your people, God says to Moses, whom you brought from the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. Now, if you look at verse number 11, Moses tried to pacify the Lord his God. He says, why are you so angry with your people? that you brought out of the land of Egypt. I love that. Moses said, don't you try to pardon them off on me. They're not my people. These are your people. They, these are your people. Um, and, and so Moses says, you know, don't, don't, don't put that on me. Some folks will make you just talk straight up to God. You know, I mean, there, there's people that, that will, uh, especially sometimes church folks, you know, and they'll just, you know, God's kind of talking to you, and you're like, wait a minute, God. These are, these are your people. I'm doing everything that I can. But I want you to notice, and this is really where I'm trying to get to today, I want you to notice the love that Moses had for these people. Over in verse number 30 of the same chapter, it says, The next day Moses said to the people, You have committed a terrible sin, but I will go back up to the Lord on the mountain Perhaps I will be able to obtain forgiveness for your sin. So Moses returned to the Lord and he said, What a terrible sin these people have committed. They made gods of gold for themselves. But now, if you will only forgive their sin, but if not, erase my name from the record you have written. Now, this is powerful stuff. You want to see love in the long haul? This is it. He goes to God and he says, God, I want you to forgive them. But if you won't forgive them, if you insist on destroying them, then go ahead and destroy me too. Because I love these people. Now, that's tough. I love my congregation. But I don't know if I love them that much. Your pastor loves you. But I don't know if he would go to God and say, Lord, I'm asking you to forgive these people. But if you won't, go ahead and destroy me too. And that's what Moses, that's what Moses says to these people. 
Moses says basically to God, God has said, leave me alone that I may destroy these people. And God, and Moses says, if you have to destroy them, destroy me too. But listen to me, God, I will not leave you alone. I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm not going to stop praying. I'm not going to stop asking. I'm not going to stop believing. I'm not going to stop interceding. I'm going to keep on keeping on. And if you have to kill them, then kill me too. But I will not leave you alone. And church, if you're honest, some of you are here today because somebody, some mama, some daddy, some grandmother, some grandfather, some preacher, some friend, somebody went to God on your behalf and said, God, I will not leave you alone. I'm going to keep praying. I'm going to keep interceding. I'm going to keep saying, I am not finished. I will not leave you alone. Somebody stood in the gap and made up the hedge for you, and that's why you're here today, because somebody wouldn't leave leave God alone. While, while, you were, while you were out drinking and drugging and fornicating and acting crazy, somebody was standing in the gap for you and saying, God, I will not leave you alone. I'm going to keep praying and I'm going to keep believing and I'm going to keep interceding. Church, I believe in prayer and I believe that prayer changes things. If I didn't believe it before this past Friday, I certainly believe it now. Harvey and I were playing golf. We played the front nine, nobody in front of us. We just went right through, got to the back nine. There was four guys in front of us. It was just the two of us. So golf etiquette says, you know, if you got a faster team behind you, just let them play through. And so we got there and we played one hole behind them. They teed off on the next hole, which was just a little par three. Well, they hollered at us and they said, come on through. Well, that's fine and that's wonderful. Except if you're amateur golfers like we are, nobody likes to tee off with a crowd. And here's four guys standing on this green saying, come on through. Now, this is a hole I don't particularly like. I, I, for some reason, I'm just lucky to put it on the green somewhere. So I'm like, oh, man, look, they're just staring at us. So I grab my club and I walk up to the tee box. I said, Lord, let me hit a good shot. I don't want to embarrass myself. And so I walked up to the tee box, looked down the fairway, took back, swung, watched the ball. I said, hey, it's going to hit the green. Hit the green and rolled up this far from the pin. Okay? Harvey's looking at me. He says, what? <laughs> what? What? I said, did you not hear me pray when I walked up here? <laughs> so he walks up, you know, and he's just kind of walking up and looking and he sort of mumbles under his breath, me too, Lord, me too. <laughs> and he hit a pretty good shot. Not as good as mine, but pretty good shot. So I believe in prayer. I believe that God answers prayer. And so I, I you know, I, I would say to you, don't Leave God alone. That loved one that you're praying for, keep praying, keep preaching, keep witnessing. Because I believe prayer changes things. You, you say, well, I don't really believe, you know, you can change God's mind. Listen to me. Moses changed God's mind. Abraham changed God's mind. David changed God's mind. In church, you and I can change God's mind too. In fact, God says, I sought for a man who would stand in the gap and make up the hedge for a people that I should not destroy it. I believe God is wanting to change his mind. I believe that God is looking for people today who will tell him, Lord, I will not leave you alone. I'm going to stand, I'm going to pray, I'm going to believe you. And, and, and I, you know what I believe? I honestly believe this with all my heart, that many times God is saying to us, you know what I want? I want to know how bad do you want it? How bad do you want it? How long are you willing to pray? How much, how much are you? God spoke to my heart one time as clear as God ever spoke to my heart and said, listen to me, I want you to stop talking to me about things that don't matter to you. Because I got in the little habit, kind of like a lot of people do. I just sort of, you know, maybe go through my little prayer list and Lord bless them and bless them and bless them. And God spoke to my heart and said, quit talking to me about things that don't even matter to you. Things you don't even care about. You're just praying. What I want you to do is I want you to open the floodgates of your heart and I want you to begin talking to me about things that matter to you because if it matters to you, it matters to me. 
And I want you to be, begin praying and talking to me and believing me for things that are important to you. If it's important to you, then it's important to me. So don't leave God alone. God's looking for people. Uh, look, look at what he said in verse uh, 11 and 12. He said, but Moses tried to pacify the Lord his God. Lord, why are you so angry with your own people whom you brought up from the land of Egypt with such great power and a strong hand? Why let the Egyptians say their God rescued them? You know what? I want to read, read this out of the King James because I like the way King James says this. Listen. Verse, verse 11. Moses besought the Lord his God. And he said, Lord, why doeth thy wrath wax hot against thy people, which thou hast brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Wherefore, should the Egyptians speak and say, for mischief did he bring them out to slay them in the mountains and consume them from the face of the earth? Now listen to what Moses said to God. Turn from your fierce wrath, and repent of this evil against your people. Who, who tells God to repent? Moses did. Moses said, Lord, you brought these people out. And now the Egyptians are going to say, you just brought them out for mischief. You just brought them out to toy with them. If you turn around and destroy them, they're just going to laugh at you and laugh at us. And he said, Lord, I'm asking you to repent of this evil thing that you're planning on doing to this. And you say, that's crazy. It is crazy. Let me show you something crazier than that. Look at verse 14. And the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do to this people. Whoo, some of you just lost your religion. That's all right. You should have got rid of it years ago. Because religion won't help your relationship with. Moses had a relationship with the Lord. Now, b before, you, before you totally just freak out on me, let me, you know, when Moses asks God to repent, he's simply asking God to change his mind. In fact, if, if you look at it in the New Living, he says, God, change your mind from this evil thing. Moses had a relationship with God, and he asked God to change his mind, to turn around, to make a change, and that's what Moses asked God to do, and that's exactly what God did. God changed his mind. Why? Because Moses would not leave God alone. He would not leave God alone. Look what Moses told the Lord in verse number 13. He says, remember, Moses saying to God, remember your servants Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You said unto them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven. And all this land that I have spoken of will I give unto your seed, and they shall inherit it forever. Remember, remember, remember. Now, it's not that God has forgotten, but sometimes the Lord just likes to know that we haven't forgotten. Sometimes we need to go to God and say, Lord, remember your covenant. Lord, remember that your word says by your stripes I am healed. Remember that, Lord? Lord, remember that you said you would rebuke the devourer for my sake. Remember, Lord, you said if I would give, you would give back, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Lord, you remember that if I would cry out to you, that you would, you would save me and my household. Remember your covenant, Lord? Remember? So it's not that God forgets, but God wants to know that we haven't forgotten. Lord, don't, don't remember, don't forget, because I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm going to keep reminding you of your word. I'm going to keep reminding you of the covenant. I'm going to keep reminding you of the relationship that we have. So maybe some of you need to go to God on behalf of a loved one today and say, Lord, I'm not going to leave you alone. I am not going to quit praying. That, that, that's my husband. That's my wife, that's my father, my mother. That's my child, Lord. That's my, my brother, that's my sister. I love them, Lord. I may not agree with what they're doing, but I love them. 
Lord, I, I may hate the fact of what they're involved in, but, but I love them. I, I may not understand why they're rebelling, Lord, but I love them. I don't condone their behavior, Lord, but I love them. I'm, I'm not making excuses for them, understand, Lord, but I love them, and I'm, I'm going to be the one to stand in the gap and make up the hedge for these people. I will not leave you alone. I, I'm, gonna, I'm not ready to end my marriage. I'm not ready to end my friendship. I'm not ready to quit my job. I'm not ready to give up on my children. I'm not through standing yet. I'm not through praying yet. I'm not through giving yet. I'm not through crying yet. I'm not through believing yet. I know it looks bad, but I am still here. Been through hell and high water with them. Been through all kind of things. They keep disappointing, but Lord, I am still here. I am not giving up. I, and and, and I, even if I don't see any change, I'm still believing. Lord, I will not leave you alone. I'm not going to leave you alone. Remember, Jacob was wrestling with the angel. And the angel said to Jacob, let me go. And Jacob said, I'll not let go till you bless me. I'm not letting go till you bless me. Listen to me. Some of you here today, some of you who, who may be watching this online, if you're ever going to be free of whatever it is controlling you, if you're ever going to be healed, if you're ever going to be saved, if you're ever going to be made whole, if you're going to ever get the victory over drugs, over lust, over whatever may be binding you. If you're ever going to see your loved ones saved, if you're ever going to see your marriage healed, you're going to have to grab hold of the horns of these altars and say, God, I will not let go until you bless me. I am not through praying yet. I'm not going to leave you alone. Jesus told the disciples one time, They've been trying to cast these demons out and, you know, and get things straight, the things that bind in them in their lives, and, and they can't do it. And along comes Jesus, and, and he cast the demons out. And they said, why? Why is it you can do this? And he said, some things come only by prayer and fasting. Sometimes, church, you just can't leave God alone. Sometimes you've got to take it to another level. You've been praying and praying and praying and begging and asking and seeking and talking and you feel like, you know, that I'm just, I'm done. It's easy to say, Lord, I just we're ready to wash my hands of it. But listen to me. Don't you dare leave God alone. God is looking for a person who will stand in the gap. God is looking for a person who says, I want it that bad. That I don't care what I see with my eyes. I don't care what I hear with my ears. I don't care how many times I've asked God. I will not leave you alone. I'm not ready to give up on my marriage. I am not ready to give up on my children. I'm not ready to give up on my family. I'm not ready to give up on this friend of mine. Listen, don't you dare leave God alone. Because this may be the prayer that changes everything. This may be the day that changes everything. Maybe God brought me all the way down I-10 for five hours just to tell you, don't leave God alone. Don't you stop praying. The Bible says the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. So whatever it is in your life that you're struggling with, whatever it is that you've been praying for, and listen, I'm not saying that all prayers aren't important or that God doesn't hear all prayers. But God wants you to open the floodgates of your heart and talk to him about things that matter to you. Talk to him about things that are important to you because listen to me, if it's important to you, it's important to him. You're his child. And sometimes God says, how bad do you want it? How bad do you want it? Are you willing to keep coming? Jesus told stories about that. Somebody that just kept knocking on the master's door. And finally he said, I'm going to do it just to stop them from knocking. Just because they're so persistent. God loves persistence. God loves faith that doesn't give up. God doesn't always answer your first prayer the way you want him to. Sometimes I tell people God answers every prayer. Sometimes it's Yes. Sometimes it's no. Sometimes it's not now. Jonah's mama was probably praying, Lord, bless my boy today. 
God, he's out there on the water. Keep him safe. And whatever you do, don't let him fall overboard. <laughs> but that wasn't in God's plan, was it? But God had a plan. Trust God's plan, but do not leave God alone. Would you bow your heads with me? Lord, I just thank you that you're God and we're not. But we are made in your image. And God, that you love faith. You love persistence. You love, God, when we will dig our heels in. And we let you know and say to you, I will not leave you alone. I will not stop praying. I won't stop believing. I'm not ready to give up on whatever it is that I'm praying for, that I'm going to stand. And Lord, I pray for those who are in this building today. I pray for those who are watching online, Lord, because I believe that there are many who are maybe at the point of ready to throw their hands up and say, you know, I've done all I can do. And this may be the day, God, that you turn things around when we say, Lord, I'm not giving up and I'm not going to leave you alone till you bless me, till you change things, till my loved ones come to know you, till I get set free of this thing in my life, till my marriage is saved and restored. I will not give up. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This program is brought to you through the faithful support of the members and partners of Golden Triangle Church on the Rock. For more information about our church or to find other programming and additional resources, check out our website at www.cotr.com. Join us here next time. And until then, we pray God blesses you to make a living, make a life, and make a difference.